Hello. You remember the story of Salome, yes? It's in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. It was always, it was also referred to by Josephus, the Jewish historian from the first century. Salome was a beautiful girl and she was dancing there. Her mother was Herodia, who had divorced her father and had married King Herod. And um, John the Baptist was there rebuking her because it was against Mosaic law and uh, she absolutely, absolutely hated uh, John the Baptist. And so Salome is there dancing away and she dances so beautifully that Herod says to her, whatever you wish, I shall grant. And prompted by her mother, she says, I want the head of John the Baptist. Herod wasn't too happy about that actually, but he had promised her and so sure enough, the head of John the Baptist is delivered to him on a silver platter, as it were. This is what our Western leaders are doing. They are delivering their country's heart and head to the king. NATO or whoever, the United States, the tribe, whoever they are. Now, you remember the story of, this is from Greek mythology of Cronus, Sat, uh, Saturn, yes, in, in the Latin. He was a god, pre Zeus. Zeus was his son. And um, he had a lot. Whoops, a mosquito here. Um, he had a lot of children. His wife Rhea had a lot of children, and he would devour each one of his children, just swallow them. There is a horrifying portrait, a picture by Goya, of 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 him, of Saturn eating his baby. You know, with and you see the picture without the head and horrific, it's, it's, it's horrid. Anyway, he did that because he thought that one of them would come up to challenge him in his kingdom. And so he just swallowed them, except for the very last one who was Zeus who would become the god of gods. Yes, and she was his mother. I have a, mus a thing here. <laughs> and his mother actually hid him and then took a, a big rock, a stone, and wrapped it in swaddling clothes and gave it to him when he asked for the baby to eat him. She gave it to him and uh, Hopefully he burst. No, he didn't. He went to live in paradise somewhere because Zeus um, afterwards took over. Anyway, that's the story. I want to refer to these myths. Um, this, this, in, in my in my uh, video today, in my conversation with you today. Because I, I, I find myself, when I look at the world, I find myself as if I were in a sort of a, 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 an opera by Mozart. I go from laughter to tears, back to laughter, back to tears. I don't know, perhaps it's a farce even, not even an opera, a pantomime of what we are seeing here. I want to talk about two specific cases. One is what is happening in Georgia, and the other one is what happened in Slovakia. Okay, Georgia. It's the government there. It's called Georgia Dream, and he has been. He was elected. He the last election they won, democratically elected, about sixty-five percent of the vote. A few weeks back, they decided that there was a lot of um, paid 
foreign influence in the country. And so they decided not by edict to propose a law to be debated in parliament or assembly, I don't know how they call it, but in their parliament to be debated and to see whether it could pass or not. And the law was that uh, uh, political parties, political organizations, uh, action, activity, political activity groups and so on, they would have to declare if they got their funding for more than 20% of it, in between 20 and 100%, that they would have to declare it. That was all. They would have to declare uh, that those were foreign funds. That is not an extreme or excessive proposal, I don't find. I mean, a lot of countries have it. The United States has it. Um, Russia has it. The United States actually has it for everyone to be... Um, I know, I have something here. Um, and everyone has to, de to, to declare that, except for the IPAC, the Jewish lobby. They don't have to declare it, but everyone else has, because the nation has to know, you know, if you're getting the majority of your funds from abroad, obviously you are going to have their interests into, you're going to take their interests into account. They're funding you. and they're going to, You're going to do whatever they ask you to do. And so a government, any government, any 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 government, uh, you know, has has to has to know that whether you are a foreign agent or not. Anyway, so I think the law passed now. But what happened was that thousands and thousands of people, Georgians, came to the streets to protest against against that law being debated even. Now, why? There are, in a tiny country like Georgia, apparently there are over 25,000 of these foreign organizations, all promoting Western values, let's say, so-called. Okay? So you can imagine the Soros, the this and that, everybody else. Okay? And... Um, so it could be that those thousands of people were employees of these organizations, anyway. So uh, looking after their paycheck at the end of the month. But what actually, uh, what, uh, what prompted me to talk about this is that there is a <clears throat> some images of the protesters there, and then there are three foreign ministers from different countries, from foreign countries, there on the dais, sort of, you know, encourage them and promoting them. I'm sure they gave speeches and so on. The, the foreign minister, I, I believe it was from Latvia or Iceland and also from Estonia. Now, what are those foreign ministers doing there encouraging this? Because it all reminds reminds us of, of what happened in 2014 in Ukraine, in the Maidan. It started like that, provoking uh, all these demonstrations. And it did happen in Georgia too, that uh, there were, there were uh, detainees, there were people injured. There was an attempt to go into and to take parliament. And all you needed now to make to 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 be like like the Ukraine Maidan thing was some snipers on the roofs shooting at people and then saying that it was the demonstrators and that would be it. This is extremely unfair because well unfair is the the least of it but. You know, Georgia was already provoked in this way in 2008 to go openly like Ukraine against Russia, and they had to go into a war with Russia. And of course, they 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 lost, and uh, you know, it didn't last very long, thank God. But and then they proceeded to 
live their lives and try to get on with everybody, I suppose. And here they are, you know, um, chaos and and, uh, and all these being promoted again by foreign entities. What are those foreign ministers doing there? Come on, think about it. Imagine that, I don't know, you know, in France during the Yellow Vests demonstrations, for example, okay, that the foreign minister of Russia, uh, Lavrov, was, was there encouraging them and making speeches. Or the foreign minister from, from China or some pla- or Italy or someplace else. Why, why is it that they feel that they, that why do they feel so arrogant that they feel that they can, with impunity, they can go to a foreign country and promote discord and even violence because this is it seems to me what NATO is doing at the moment NATO is turning into you know the overt side of the CIA you know the CIA the FBI in covert operations they are NATO openly promoting discord all over the place now the reason why I told you about Salome, the, 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 what brought it to my mind is that the president of Georgia, not the prime minister, but the president, is called Salome. Salome Soravishvili. Let me tell you about the president of Georgia, who is obviously on the side of the, not obviously, I'll tell you why, the, on the side of the demonstrators. Pro-NATO, obviously. She was born in France. She lived in France practically all her life, except for the time when she was a student in the United States at Columbia University under the tutorship of Brzezinski himself. Brzezinski, you know, the uh, state, the... um, Get the title now, Secretary of State. I don't know. Was it under Reagan or Bush? Bush father. I remember his face actually. Um, he, I think he came from Poland originally. He had a little bit of a foreign accent there, so he was probably raised um, abroad, not in the United States. But in any case, okay. But he's he's the famous one. He's actually just to give it a title, the founder of the neocon movement, as it were, the one who, who wrote that book, the, uh, the chessboard, yeah, and uh, the one who, who said, let us, let us separate uh, Russia from the rest of Europe, let's keep Russia isolated, uh, cut off from the rest of all that, okay? So she studied under him. Okay, so then she went back to France, she's French, and there she was the uh, foreign secretary uh, to NATO, the first uh, secretary France permanent mission to NATO in Brussels. Then she held another office also representing France in NATO and so on. Now she is the president of Georgia. This woman is the president of Georgia. Well, to me, she's a NATO person. She's an agent of NATO. She is a NATO official trained under Brzezinski in the US, and she is now the president of Georgia encouraging all these demonstrators. And I would say if if Georgians, and I'm sure they do have it, if they have a minimum of patriotism for their country in their veins, and by patriotism I mean national dignity, they should just get rid of this woman. She's there to promote NATO not to promote what is best for their country. It could be being in NATO, perhaps not. But she's there as a NATO agent. 
They should just, in the next elections, which I think on this year or, or at the beginning of next year, they should just um, get rid of this character as soon as possible. Have to kick her out. Because she's a dagger, a NATO dagger in the heart of the nation, in the heart of Georgia. And what was Estonia doing there? Or oh, I think Latvia too, uh, these uh, Baltic republics. And the demonstrators were carrying European flags, European Union flags, the Estonian flags. What was the Estonian flag doing there in Georgia? Estonia is a place that has just prohibited the um, learning and the speaking of the Russian language in a place called Narva, where 90% of the inhabitants there are Russians and they speak Russian. Why are they Russians in, in Latvia? Because when the Soviet Union collapsed and so many people who were not Latvians or Estonians Okay, they, they were Russians and they lived in Estonia or Ukraine or, where, or Crimea or wherever. And when he was separated and cut off, these people were cut off from Russia being Russians. And now this Kajakala's girl is prohibiting the... She feels very, you know, cool doing all this. Prohibiting the Russian language in Estonia. What else about these um, Baltic republics? Well, they are a veritable money laundering places. Money laundering for organized crime for the whole world. That's what they are and that is what they do. They're laundering their more money than the whole state budget many times over. That's what they do. Those are the Baltic republics. Vassals of NATO at the service of the darkest interest, a laundering sink of organized crime, drug trafficking, sale of weapons, human trafficking, that is what they do. These postage stamp republics. And this is what they do. And then they have the goal to go and destabilize another country that's just, that suffered, had to go through a war, and now we're just trying to get along and do whatever is best for their country. I think it's just absolutely abominable what, what they are doing. Let's move on to Slovakia and what happened there. Uh, well, apparently the latest we heard is that he is He's alive, the Prime Minister, Fitzo, and um, he's recovering. We don't know. I, I, I personally don't know. I haven't heard any latest news as to whether he's getting much better or still in, in critical condition. I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, some people say, well, it's uh, the security services. Yes, the security services obviously... Uh, committed an error, obviously, because this man was there. This There's always a lone wolf, a lone gunman there, but in any case. Um, I heard people say, look, Slovakia, actually, if you went there, it was a, sort of a nice, very nice place, nice people, quiet. I heard someone saying, it reminded me of how um, you know the Scandinavian countries or Denmark in the in the sixties or the seventies used to be where the prime minister 
bicycled <laughs> to to Parliament and so on. There was um, there was a sense of trust that uh, nothing could happen really. But of course, things happened now in this in this world, especially in that part of the world. So um, I don't know the security service. They seem to be perhaps they they didn't uh, rehearse a lot or something. But they were all running around. Then they put the body in the car. Then the driver left the car and went to help with that. that it just seemed a little bit of a chaos there, but. Uh, I'm not, not necessarily, it was an error, for sure. Um, now, what has to be said is also that Slovakia has been brutally, relentlessly attacked, or well, the Prime Minister, his party, by the West, by the Western media non-stop, brutal, the attack, in many cases. Because he is a man, sort of like Orban, that um, has criticized the presence, so much uh, presence, American presence in Europe. Um, he went against sending arms to Ukraine, he said that he would veto Ukraine's entry into NATO. He was very outspoken about it. So he was another urban kind of thing. Okay. Uh, he also went very much against the... Um, he was very open about uh, his criticisms of the, um, of the World Health Organization. Um, he spoke plainly about how this particular organization and many others, which by the way is a private organization, is a private entity, okay? It sounds just like the Federal Reserve in the United States. The word federal sounds national. No, it's a private entity. The World Health Organization is a private entity. It is funded by private funds. Bill, Melinda, the other, the other, a million of them, okay? And now, in, uh, now in May, in late May, perhaps, uh, is, uh, is going to, all the governments uh, of the world, well, not all of them, but certainly of the West, are going to, are going to sign off on the World uh, uh, Health Organization, actually being the one with the power to say to, to to say what has to be done in each country, their guidelines, rules and regulations and so on, if another illness comes along and what medicaments to provide and whether people have to be confined again or not. And all the Western countries are going to sign off on that. Another giveaway, another little piece of sovereignty of the country. And uh, Fitzo was very much and very outspoken about this. What else <coughs> do I have? Um, so, Orban is not alone, it seems, and uh, he better be careful too. But about this lone gunman, lone wolf thing, I just want to remind you, because there are so many of them on there, whenever something happens there is always this one person. Okay, and do you know, have you heard of the network Gladio? Gladio. This was uh, a NATO organization under the auspices of NATO, but covert, in the 60s and 70s. They were sort of like the Antifa or something, okay? They were the false flag um, people, the, the brown shirts 
to call upon when to do something to destabilize the country whenever it was needed. Uh, this false flag, actually in Spanish they call it um, the uh, to the thief. The thief is there. <laughs> It doesn't translate well, uh, but is uh, you know in olden times when uh, if you committed a crime and the uh, you were coming out and the police were coming in, you would just say, "Oh, that, that, the the thief is over there. I saw him run," and the police would run, and then you escaped. Okay, that that sort of sense. That is the fault. It doesn't translate. Um, that is the false flag thing. Well, the, these Gladio people were very much present in Europe in the 60s and 70s when uh, communist parties in Europe were very strong, especially in Italy and France, yes? And so all of a sudden, when they, they were getting too close to being in power, something would happen. A prime minister would be kidnapped uh, by these people, you know, by the communists or, uh, you know, I remember Aldo Moro who was, um, uh, the president, prime minister of Italy, president um, of Italy, uh, he had been many times, elected many times, and then all of a sudden he was um, kidnapped and then killed. And uh, it was the communist, the red, uh, what was it, the red something, the red guerrillas, don't remember the name, the red something. But anyway, it was the communist. And so obviously the reaction was to go against the communists. Yeah. And also, not only that, that would be, if, uh, he was a Christian Democrat, so he was kind of on the center right. But uh, the uh, case of uh, Olof Palmer, um, Palme, um, the Aldo Moro thing, his assassination happened in, I believe it was in 78, something like that. And um, all of Palmer, I think it happened in 1986. He was the Swedish prime minister. He was very much in those days, nuclear arms was very much on the, on the front line. There were demonstrations and against nuclear arms, this and that. And he was a pacifist and he was against uh, obviously NATO and all this. And uh, one day coming out of the cinema with his wife just walking along, he had dismissed his very few uh, guards that he had, the ex escort guards. He had dismissed them and then all of a sudden, whoa, there is a lone gunman. <laughs> um, killed him. Uh, he killed him. And uh, he was caught and then there was, oh, the usual thing with the Nordic countries. They, they have to drop the investigation. There isn't enough evidence for this or for that. Uh, he was in prison for a while, but then something had anyway. And he ended up committing suicide. Um, yeah. Uh, so one wonders. I'm just speculating here, but look, perhaps this Gladio or Gladio 2.0 2 is, uh, is, is there, uh, you know, because in a in different form, in a different dress. But it was a NATO uh, organization. And uh, I doubt that it was dismantled. You know, those sleeping cells that lay low for a while. But I, I just don't know whether they would dismantle a network that worked so well and so effectively just because the Cold War ended. I don't know. Whether, I don't even know whether the Cold War ended or whether it was just the narrative that they gave us. They seem to have continued actively. Anyway, so, um, but the the purpose of, of these uh, organizations is to uh, destabilize, to, to create tensions, to create divisions. You know how sometimes in the United States, in the United States for example, you see, um, you know, um, 
agent provocateurs, you know, the FBI saying, now we must go into the building, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and they create chaos. And, uh, and then whoever is demonstrating, perhaps peacefully, gets blamed for what happens afterwards. Oh, remember the uh, the coup in Greece too in 1966. The colonels and I I don't know whether they they had they have been been dismantled or they're still there being called by other names. Um, in any case, uh, I told you about um, Salome, but <laughs> let me tell you about Cronus. Saturn in the Latin, okay, he was a god, a god before the gods, before Zeus, the god of gods. Before him there were other gods, the main gods, the elder gods, uh, called the Titans, and the king was Cronus, or in Latin Saturn, and uh, he devoured, as I told you this at the beginning, he devoured his his children. And I just, uh, and I just wonder where, whether all these, all these dancing Salome's <laughs> that we have governing us, and not only giving our hearts and heads of their nations to the king. But the king may be Saturn, who then proceeds to chew them and swallow them all. I was listening to... Um, so, so, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of... For the rulers of the world, Okay, I don't want to say, well, I'm not going to even say NATO or the United States or the deep state or the swamp or the globalist or all these names that we have. I'm going to call it the tribe. Okay, and the tribe, I'm going to say, are those in power whom we do not see. Below them are all the financial interests of the world, all the bankers. Okay, the... Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about that a little bit more because I also want to discuss the it's not only the Federal Reserve and the the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund it's also the G30 yeah the the group of 30 we'll talk about that some other time but anyway international finance and so so, so our leaders are just there you know they're just basically obeying orders and I was listening to uh, there is a YouTube channel that uh, probably most of them, most of you follow. Um, Dialogue works. Yes, I think the interviewer is um, is Brazilian. I'm not sure, but today he was interviewing um, Professor Richard Wolf, um, who is an American economist and very famous. And uh, in the first three minutes he said about how the United States at the moment is acting in the world and he says I, I just don't know whether they look at themselves and they, they listen to themselves he's American and he said I, I imagine the Chinese and the Russians and everybody else sitting at a table saying what? Because um, he said they're not they're not really doing too well. They seem to be losing everywhere. But even even in Hollywood, even the PR, as it were, that Hollywood did so well, we were not aware that we were being, uh, you know, I don't want to say indoctrinated, but. Uh, manipulated no we didn't feel any manipulation I didn't from from Hollywood they were telling us stories and and so on but um, 
they were flooding the world through uh, with this um, PR, really, uh, about American American way of life and so on. And he said that, that not even they are doing too well. They're not. He said they're not doing well at all. They are n- no longer persuading anybody of anything. Not even the United States. He said that the people are looking at us and they're saying, "What, what is coming from there?" And he says, and "No longer the United States has the dominance that it once had, but it it's beginning to even look ridiculous." Because the leaders keep talking as if they were still in the 1970s. They are still giving orders, con- trying to, you know, controlling the world, telling others, other people what they can't do and what they can do, telling, for example, of late the International Criminal Court uh, what it has jurisdiction over and what it does not have d- jurisdiction over. Uh, celebrating them when they accuse Putin, but denouncing it now because they they um, uh, said what they said about Netanyahu, and he says this is so obvious, this is so evident. He said it's it's gross. It's not just that they're shooting themselves in the foot. It's that it's not even clever. It is not sophisticated. It's kind of crappy. Losing everywhere and pretending that they aren't. And this is what Professor uh, Professor Richard Wolff was saying, and I would add, yes, they're almost becoming a caricature. You know, it's as if you are seeing the the um, the emperor naked. Well, not naked. Uh, he's still carrying a crown, sort of a a tin crown. You know, bought in the dollar store. And and there they are, and. Uh, all of us are seeing them naked, but then we have all our leaders, all our Salomés dancing around <laughs> to please him. And I have this view of, of a naked emperor on, on one side of, of my mind, and on the other side I have this Godzilla. You remember that movie... Um, it's from the 1930s, you know, the uh, when, uh, when a gorilla on top of the um, Empire State Building. You remember, what was the name of the gorilla? Um, Kung Tzu? No, 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 no Kung Fu. <laughs> uh, I don't know the name. Godzilla. I, anyway, and he's there like this and so on. And all over the place. And... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's like you see uh, they're desperate and they look so desperate that you, th- you even want to give them a hug or something <laughs> we are seeing them for what they are uh, but they, they continue to, to behave as, as, as if nothing had happened they don't see themselves It's quite amazing. And so we see blinking with his hair perfectly coiffed, you know. And our leaders uh, Canada, Trudeau, Macron, Sanchez in Spain, they're all they even look they even look the same. A sort of kind of pretty to look at, I suppose, if you're 15, but kind of 
no spine, not tes testosterone less. <laughs> <laughs> Am I a pudding lover? Ah. Well, <laughs> at least he seems to have enough testosterone. <laughs> no, I mean, at least at least the man stands up and defends his country, which is more than what ours do. And the ladies, you know, the Kajakalas of Estonia, this girl and the other, Sanna Marine of Finland, uh, and the other one, and all the other, oh my gosh. They're easier to manipulate because, you see, men... Okay, men at least have to be, if not blackmail, they, they need something. They need success or they need money or they need power or they need something there. But women, they just need to be admired. And that's cheap. You know, all they have to to do is to be promised that they will be the head of organization that this as long as they are there in the public eye and they have some sort of little power not too expensive that the women's uh, the women leaders of Europe seem to me like you remember that movie since we're talking about movies you remember that movie from the 30s or 40s also um, oh I forgot the name but it was Gloria Swanson who was a great actress who was portraying this very aged already uh, Hollywood actress but saw herself still as if she were 19 and she wanted to play young girl roles and so on and, and there is this thing where she she comes down descending the stairs and then she says the famous uh, what is it I am ready for my close-ups Mr. DeVille and this this is when I look at them, that is what I see. Glorious ones and you know, and they all also look at the same, the same hair, the same and except for Ursula. Ursula van der Leyen doesn't Ursula van der Leyen, the way I see her is with a prison guard uniform and a whip that, that is how I see her um, her face goes together with a certain uniform that's how I pay I can't even look at them anyway so um, <clears throat> I'm sorry I, I, I keep going from something ter very serious to to Uh, trying to put a sort of a smile, but um, a fake a smile, really. But it's uh, it's very serious, and I I don't know because you see I I have um, we are so powerless, aren't we? Because we really can't do much. We cannot choose really because they're all the same from this party, from that party. Um. I don't, I don't know. We we are going to have to pick up our pitchforks and go there and listen to them. And while they're saying close up and, or dancing away all these salomes, um, we're going to have to show them. We have to get our pitchforks and show them the guillotine. Hey! Somehow. In little ways. Look. I went to 
we can all do a little something at least to at least to stop what is happening yeah look i i went to uh, to the town center today because i keep reminding myself that i have to use cash because we have to protect cash because i see cash like we, I've, I've been through it through this before in the 1970s when credit cards were introduced, little by little, and we all said, "Oh, how great!" You know, you don't actually have to have the cash in your hand. Fantastic, you know. And we all, well, not all, but the silly ones like me, started using it as if it was additional income until we realized, no, this was not a loan as such. This was a business. Okay. Uh, and we all learned the lesson, but they were introduced more and more and then the debit cards and so on. And it's not as if our governments are going to say tomorrow or in a year's time or in two years time, uh, cash will be forbidden. No, they're not going to say that, but they're going to little by little, step, step by step, are going to take it away. I, I went to town and I said, no, I have to remember to use cash. So I went to the ATM, to the cash point, and it was no longer there. I don't know when, it, when they took it out, and the bank was no longer there. So I went opposite across the road to the other bank, and it somewhat, and, and, and it was open, and they had the machines there. And in a somewhat flippant way, I said, you're not going to do away with your machines, are you, anywhere, any anytime soon? I said, yes, yes, we are. Uh, in July, we're taking them away. Why? Why? Oh, well, we are closing the bank. We're closing down. Which means that there will only be one bank in town, and that is a very tiny one, too. So if that goes, I'll have to inquire because that is my bank. Um, there will be no banks in the city and therefore no cash points, ATMs. And this is what is happening little by little. And in some places, which I refuse to, to go to when, when, when they tell you that no, we don't, uh, we don't accept any cash, that is illegal, actually. You could actually say, look, this pound note here, this, this uh, five pound note is legal tender. You have to accept it. It is legal tender. Uh, I think we have to, to, to start, uh, you know, complaining a little bit about little things, but like that, and perhaps start demanding of our politicians that they promise that this won't happen and that won't happen, something like that. Not that if they promise, they will keep their promises anyway. But we have to be aware and start fighting back. Otherwise, our children and grandchildren are going to live in a world that we can't even envisage. Oh, okay, well, um, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.